This morning I'm going to be teaching on blessings and cursings, and I think this is a, an important topic uh, just because if you misunderstand it, uh, there are incorrect positions that people have uh, when they misunderstand how the Old Testament and New Testament uh, link together and how you understand these blessings and cursings uh, like we just read in Deuteronomy 11. So obviously you have false teaching out there, uh, which I will go through, and then we need to understand how to understand these correctly because it can actually change uh, how you view your relationship with God, right? And I'll explain that uh, as we go through the sermon. But blessings and cursings. Blessings and cursings are things we see in the Old Testament. And the first thing we want to talk about is that there is a blessing and a cursing uh, that is associated with the law of Moses. If we just go back to Deuteronomy 11, where we just read in verse 26, he says here, Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse, a blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day, and a curse if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside out of the way which I command you this day to go after other gods which ye have not known. And it shall come to pass when the Lord thy God hath brought thee in unto the land whither thou goest to possess it, that thou shalt put the blessing upon Mount Gerizim and the curse upon Mount Ebal. So if you understand your Bible, you'll know that this blessing is, and cursing is associated with the law of Moses because this is what the old covenant was, right? The old covenant was that if you kept the commandments of God, you will be blessed. And if you did not keep the commandments of God, you would not be blessed. And we know that nobody keeps this covenant, right? That's why we needed the covenant of grace. And, you know, they were, they were given this covenant, but obviously Israel could not keep it, right? Even though God used them as a shadow of what would happen if you didn't keep it and if you kept it and his mercy and whatnot. We see that in the Old Testament. That's where this blessing and cursing comes in. Now we read in Deuteronomy 28, it gives us a whole list and really a rundown of like what it's talking about with these blessings and cursings. And in Deuteronomy 28, it's a long chapter, we're only going to read about two thirds of it, but most of it is about the cursings. But at the beginning it talks about the blessings. So I'll show you here, we'll just read through it together so you'll get an idea of uh, what this is talking about. Deuteronomy 28. And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee, if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Blessed shalt thou be in the city. And blessed shalt thou be in the field. So you can see how this is like all talking about the physical blessings that will come on this nation um, if they were to keep God's commandments. And like we talked about before, it, you know, it's not possible to do, but this, is, this was the promise from God, uh, the blessing and the cursing. Blessed shall be the fruit of thy body, so that's your children, and the fruit of thy ground, you know, plants, fruit of thy cattle, the increase of thy kind, so kind is cows, and the flocks of thy sheep. Blessed shall be thy basket and thy store. Blessed shalt thou be when thou comest in, and blessed shalt thou be when thou goest out. The Lord shall cause thine enemies that rise up against thee to be smitten before thy face. They shall come out against thee one way and flee before thee seven ways. The Lord shall command the blessing upon thee in thy storehouses and in all that thou settest thine hand unto, and he shall bless thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. The Lord shall establish thee and holy people unto himself, as he hath sworn unto thee. If thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God and walk in his ways, and all people of the earth shall see that thou art called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of thee. And the Lord shall make thee plenteous in goods, in the fruit of thy body, and in the fruit of thy cattle, and in the fruit of thy ground, in the land which the Lord sware unto thy fathers to give thee. The Lord shall open unto thee his good treasure, the heaven to give the rain unto thy land in his season and to bless all the work of thine hand. And thou shalt lend unto many nations and thou shalt not borrow and the Lord shall make thee the head and not the tail. And thou shalt be above only and thou shalt not be beneath. If that thou hearken unto the commandments of the Lord thy God, which I command thee this day to observe and to do them. And thou shalt not go aside from any of the words which I command thee this day to the right hand or to the left to go after other gods to serve them. So that's the blessings, right? And you can start to see that if you have listened to uh, online preachers and preachers that tend to preach what's known as the prosperity gospel, 
talk about that in a moment. You'll see that they go to a lot of these verses because on, on, on the surface, when you're just hearing phrases like this and you're not really thinking about exactly what this is saying here, you might think, hey, well, if, if I'm a Christian, look at all the good stuff that's going to happen to me, right? But uh, that's what is known as the prosperity gospel. We'll talk about that in a moment. But now we get on to the curses, verse 15. And the rest of the chapter is all curses, but I'm not going to read all of it. But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Cursed shall thou be in the city. And you can see that the curses are basically the opposite. But, you know, obviously, for some reason, God emphasizes the curses a lot more, you know, like warns more about the curses than mentions the blessings. And cursed shalt thou be in the field. Cursed shall, thy, shall be thy basket and thy store. Cursed shall be the fruit of thy body and the fruit of thy land, the increase of thy kind and the flocks of thy sheep. Cursed shalt thou be when thou comest in, and cursed, cursed shalt thou be when thou goest out. The Lord shall send upon thee cursing, vexation and rebuke in all that thou settest thine hand unto for to do until thou be destroyed and until thou perish quickly because of the wickedness of thy doings whereby thou hast forsaken me the lord shall make the pestilence cleave unto thee so you can see there's this physical illness as well until he hath consumed thee from off the land whither thou goest to possess it the lord shall smite thee with a consumption and with a fever with an inflammation with an extreme burning and with the sword and with blasting with mildew and they shall pursue thee until thou perish. And the heaven, and thy heaven that is over thy head shall be brass, and the earth that is under thee shall be iron. And the Lord shall make the rain of thy land powder and dust. From heaven shall it come down upon thee until thou be destroyed. The Lord shall cause thee to be smitten before thine enemies. Thou shalt go out one way against them and flee seven ways before them, and, thou, and, and shall be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth. And thy carcass shall be meat unto all fowls of the air and unto the beasts of the earth, and no man shall fray them away. The Lord will smite thee with the botch of Egypt and with the emeralds and with the scab and with the itch, whereof thou canst not be healed. So you can see here, incurable diseases God will send in these curses. The Lord shall smite thee with madness and blindness and astonishment of heart. And thou shalt grope at noonday, as the blind gropeth in darkness, and thou shalt not prosper in thy ways. And thou shalt be only oppressed and spoiled evermore, and no man shall save thee. Thou shalt betroth the wife, and another man shall lie with her. Thou shalt build an house, and thou shalt not dwell therein. Thou shalt plant a vineyard, and shalt not gather the grapes thereof. Thine ox shall be slain before thine eyes, and thou shalt not eat thereof. Thine ass shall be violently taken away from before thy face, and shall not be restored to thee. Thy sheep shall be given unto thine enemies, and thou shalt have none to rescue them. Thy sons and thy daughters shall be given unto another people, and thine eyes shall look and fail with longing for them all the day long, and there shall be no might in thine hand. The fruit of thy land and all thy labours shall a nation which thou knowest not eat up, and thou shalt be only oppressed and crushed alway, so that thou shalt be mad for the sight of thine eyes, which uh, thou shalt see. The Lord shall smite thee in the knees and in the legs with a sore botch that cannot be healed, from the sole of thy foot unto the top of thy head. The Lord shall bring thee, and thy king which thou shalt set over thee unto a nation which neither thou nor thy fathers have known, and there shalt, and there thou, uh, shalt thou serve other gods, wood and stone, and thou shalt become an astonishment, a proverb, and a byword among all nations, whither the Lord shall, uh, shall lead thee. Thou shalt carry much seed out into the field, and shalt gather but little in, for the locusts shall consume it. Thou shalt plant vineyards and dress them, but, neither, but shalt neither drink of the wine, nor gather the grapes, for the worms shall eat them. Thou shalt have olive trees throughout all thy coasts, but thou shalt not anoint thyself with the oil, for thine olive shall cast his fruit. Thou shalt beget sons and daughters, but thou shalt not enjoy them. But they shall go into captivity. All thy trees and fruit of thy land shall the locusts consume. The stranger that is within thee shall get up above thee very high, and thou shalt come down very low. He shall lend to thee, and thou shalt not lend to him. He shall be the head, and thou shalt be the tail. So that's just up to verse 44. 
uh, and this chapter goes up to verse like 60 something. So uh, it gets quite graphic uh, in the latter end of the chapter because it starts talking about you know, other countries are going to seed you and you're going to have to like eat your own children and things like that. And then you talk about mothers eating their own children in secret because you know, of the wickedness, right? That they're only looking out for themselves, right? And then they'll, they'd rather their children be sacrificed to feed them and uh, rather the other way around, you know? And they, they die providing for their children. So these blessings and these cursings are, are very uh, vividly described in the Bible. Um, and we can see this is the blessing and cursing that is being talked about when the Bible says, I set before you this blessing and this curse. Now, what are the incorrect positions? One I already talked about was, was what is known as the prosperity gospel. Now, I don't think it's a very accurate term because we know the gospel refers to the death, burial, and resurrection. It's the good news of what we must do in order to be saved and we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection. And if we believe that, right, then we can be saved. That's what the gospel means. But, you know, the word gospel has kind of, you know, evolved over time as people use it. And they just tend to talk about the gospel either being like, you know, God's word, you know, just Christianity as a whole, or just your faith as a whole. Uh, so when they talk about this prosperity gospel, uh, generally they're referring to the fact that you get these blessings for being a Christian, you know, like if you're just saved and you're trying to follow God, then, then you know, your life's going to be great, you're going to be healthy, you're going to get the woman or the man that you want, you're going to have children and the children are going to be healthy and, and your business is going to do well and you're going to get that promotion and life is just great as a Christian because look, God wants to bless you, God wants you to have your best life now, right? That's the, what's known as the prosperity gospel. Now, there's a few things that they have right, right, in the, in the sense that, you know, they understand that these blessings cannot be earned by works. Like this prosperity gospel, they generally don't say, like, you need to keep all the commandments and then only if you're obedient, you're going to get these blessings. Generally, it's just, you know, if you're a child of God, God wants to bless you. God wants to give you all these things. And, you know, it's just having faith in him. So they, they realize this sort of grace by faith Theme, but then where they sort of misapply these blessings, they say, okay, well, uh, you know, being saved by grace through faith, we get that blessing. Ah, oh, let's look at the blessings. Oh, these physical blessings. We should be, you know, you, you name it and you claim it, that sort of thing. So that's where they get it wrong, right? So they believe the blessings that are received are actual, actually the physical blessings that are described in chapters like Deuteronomy 28. Um, but so likewise, you know, the, the opposite also, you know, that a lack of faith would result in the cursings. But obviously, you know, that would be uh, for people that are unbelievers, right? Now, why is that not true? Because if, if, any, if you just had a, uh, like a eyes to see and ears to hear, just a brain to think, right, you'd realize, well, if that's the case, if, if I just believe on Jesus Christ and my life should be, as it's described in Deuteronomy 28, well then, why are there so many Christians that don't enjoy that life? You know, think about how Jesus lived. Think about how the apostles lived. I mean, the, you know, if, if anybody deserved these blessings because of the faith that they lived, surely they would be living their best life now. But think about how they lived. You know, and Jesus, he even said when people wanted to follow him, like, you know, the, the foxes have holes and the birds of the air has nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. He didn't even know where he was going to sleep. So this is why this is not true. I want to read to you uh, and go through this psalm. It's not too long, but we'll read through most of it. Uh, if not, actually, we're going to read through all of it. And uh, this psalm, I just love how it's written. Because, uh, you know, in most of the psalms, when you read through them, um, you know, when, when you're sort of new to the Bible, you probably read through the psalms and you really have no idea what the guy's talking about. It just, it just sounds like just random things that have been said and sort of disconnected and, and uh, generally psalms do have themes throughout them and, then, and the verses do have a theme that they follow. Uh, but this one, it, it really just reads like somebody, even though it's a song, it really reads like somebody who is, is genuinely like, you know, not understanding, you know, his situation and things like that and just pouring his heart out to God as, you, as we read through it. It says here in verse 1, Truly God is good to Israel even to such as are of a clean heart, right? So he just uh, starts off with God's goodness. And, and just so you understand as we read through it, what this, what this psalm is about, it's about somebody who, who starts to 
question, like why his life is so hard, and yet people that do not believe in God, like their life is so easy. And then you'll see his thought process throughout the psalm where he starts to sort of like come to and realize he's thinking like a fool, right? Look at this. It says, it says truly God is good to Israel, even to such, are, are, are such as are of a clean heart. But as for me, so he's saying, see how people, God is good to people that are trying to do what's right. But he says, but as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. So he's saying he knows God is good to those that love him and those that are following him. But he says, like, you know, I, almost, I almost slipped. I almost got, got into the wrong frame of mind when I looked at the wicked and the foolish and started to envy the things that they had. Right? For there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. He's saying, like, look at how healthy they are and how well they're doing. They are not in trouble as other men. Neither are they plagued like other men. Right? So it's like you see the wicked in this world. It's like, why are they doing so well? They're healthy. they got everything going right for them. This is what this guy's thinking. He's like, it's kind of like, this is not fair. You know, if I'm following God, I'm trying to do what's right, and yet they have it so good. Therefore, pride compassed them about as a chain. Violence covereth them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They could have more than heart could wish. They are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily, right? High and mighty and proudly. They set their mouth against the heavens, right? They blaspheme in God and their tongue walketh through the earth. Therefore his people return hither and waters of a full cup are wrung out to them. And they say, how doth God know? And is there knowledge in the most high Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. Verily, I have cleansed my heart in vain. I've washed my hands in innocence. innocence. Can you see what he's saying? He's saying, like, they've got it so good. He's like, have I tried to do what's right in vain? Like, am I doing this? For, like, you know, have I done the right thing? You know, because it it's not working out for me. For all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. If I say I will speak thus, behold, I should offend against the generation of thy children. He says, hey, if I really speak what I'm saying, I'm going to, you know, I'm not going to do good for the children as a good example for the next generation. So he understands that he shouldn't be saying these things and thinking these things. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. Until I went into the sanctuary of God. So you see how like his mind was not in the right place. He wasn't seeing things the right way. He didn't have the right perspective until he came to the house of God and got his perspective straightened out, his mind renewed. Then understood I their end. Surely thou didst set them in slippery places. Thou casteth them down into destruction. So you see how what changed in his perspective? He no longer was just looking at the temporary and this short life. He started to realize there's an eternity, right? He had this eternal perspective, looking at the things that are not seen and realizing, hey, these guys don't have it as good as I thought they did, right? How are they brought into desolation as in a moment they are utterly consumed with terrors? As a dream when one awaketh, so, O Lord, when thou awakest, thou shalt despise their image. Thus my heart was grieved and I was pricked in my reins. Man, his conscience, right? He's saying, ah, oh, it's wrong. So foolish was I and ignorant. I was as a beast before thee. What does that mean? It's like a, she was a stupid animal. That's what he's saying to himself. Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast holden me by my right hand. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel. Right, the word of God, and afterward receive me to glory. For whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon earth that I desire beside thee. So you can see he's now he's getting straightened up, right? Now he doesn't desire what the wicked have. God is enough for him, right? Because we realize when we have God, we are richer than any riches can make us. My flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For lo, lo means look. They that are far from thee shall perish. Thou hast destroyed all them that go a-whoring from thee. 
but it is good for me to draw near to God. I put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all thy works. So getting back to the prosperity gospel, we can see why the prosperity gospel is false because we know for a fact and just through our own experience that just because you're a believer on Jesus Christ, that doesn't mean your life goes well. And if that was the case, then Psalms like this wouldn't exist. Where somebody, this, this, By the way, this Psalm is written by Asaph, right? So Asaph was one of the singers. Um, so he's writing this Psalm. But you can see as he pours his heart out, like you can see he, he almost got, had the wrong perspective and started desiring what the wicked, the lifestyle of the wicked and what the wicked had and, and couldn't understand why when they were wicked, why was their life going well? So you can see that this blessing and this cursing is not about necessarily, you know, whether you are a believer or not because believers don't always have, you know, great life and sometimes unbelievers have you know, physically uh, success and good life and healthy children and healthy life and whatnot. But what is their end? We need to see things in an eternal perspective, right? Now, what's the second incorrect position? So the prosperity gospel is probably the one when it comes to the blessing and the cursing that you're most familiar with because that's what's popular, right? That's what sells. People want to, you know, especially amongst Chinese communities, right? In Chinese communities, man, they love the prosperity gospel because they're already used to that. They're already used to, like, you know, giving money and, and that prospering their business. If you know a lot of their traditions and whatnot, it's all about, like, prospering their business and they have their altar and they give the gold to the God because it's all about, like, making money and trying to be prosperous. And sometimes, you know, Pentecostal churches and churches that preach the prosperity gospel are often... There's a lot of Chinese people there, right? Because that's already, like, what they're used to. And now it's just like, like a different God that's sort of promising the same thing. But, you know, it's, uh, it's the same sort of practice that they have. And I've seen that amongst, um, you know, my sort of family and community and whatnot. So what's the second position that is wrong? Well, the second position is what now is more common among fundamental churches and Bible-believing churches like ours which is the wrong position. And this is that disobedience results in the cursings, right? So you have the prosperity gospel, which sort of believe by faith, but then what comes with that is the physical blessings. Well, what, well, what you'll often hear taught in Bible-believing churches, and, and generally with good intentions, because they're trying to motivate and encourage people to do the right thing, right? So it's not that their heart is necessarily in the wrong place. But what they believe is that if you do not obey God, like let's say you get out of church or you're living in sin, right, that then these cursings will come upon you. And sometimes you'll even hear it when it comes to tithing, right, when it comes to giving to the church. Uh, they'll often come to Malachi 3. This is a very famous passage, a very uh, commonly used passage to encourage people to give to the Lord, right, to give to the church and to fund the ministry. But... It's not always teaching the right doctrine. Right? Malachi 3 verse 8, look at this. Will a man rob God? Yet yeah, ye have robbed me. But you say, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me, me now we're here with now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there should not be room enough to receive it. So like I talked about with this prosperity gospel, uh, you know, amongst the Chinese and other Asian communities, um, you can see how th that's very easily taught when you only take verses from the Old Testament and don't understand them, like we talked about, you know, last week as the Bible being our final authority. We need to take all scripture into account. How somebody could teach, you see, if you give, right? If you give to God, hey, look, it's not going to be enough. You know, for you to store up all the, the, the blessings and all those prophets that God's going to send your way, right? But then, ah, oh, but then likewise the other way. And this is more so what the uh, conservative churches, you know, the fundamental sort of Bible preaching churches will hark on that have, I believe, this doctrine incorrect, is, ah, oh, but if you don't obey God, then beware, because God's wrath and indignation and cursing is coming upon you. And this is a very damaging doctrine um, because if you think that God hates you and God is angry with you every day, it's very discouraging, right? It's, it's, not, it's, it's not even true. 
Because right? God, God loves you with an everlasting love. You kind of think like, you know, what is it? Does God love me or doesn't he love me? I mean, if he loves you, obviously he's not just going to forsake you and things when you are an imperfect person, right? So this is why I'm saying this is a very important topic to understand because if you don't understand it correctly, um, it's not necessarily going to change whether you're saved or not. It's not a salvational doctrine, but what it will change is how you view your relationship with God. Right, and, and when you are in sin or when you are backslidden or you are downtrodden, you know, and you're maybe not you know, performing as you, you know you can or you should as a believer, you, know, you don't think that there's this God in heaven that's just hating on you as opposed to God in heaven that loves you, that wants you to return like the father in the, in the prodigal son uh, parable. So how it's often taught in these sorts of churches I'm talking about now is that disobedience um, results in these cursings. And they're trying to discourage disobedience um, by the threat of cursing. And, and this is just one example, right, when it comes to giving. They'll say, well, if you don't give, then so you're going to be under a curse. So you better give, you better tithe in this instance. You know, when they talk to those churches that believe in tithing, that's probably a sermon for another day. But they'll say, I see if you don't, you want to be under this curse, right? But likewise with the prosperity gospel, if the idea is that if you disobey God, you're under this curse, then, then why is it not consistent? Why are there so many people that are disobedient to God and yet they don't seem to be experiencing these curses? See, likewise, the other with the prosperity gospel. There are believers in Christ, but why aren't they all experiencing all of the blessings and the, prosperity, and the physical prosperity, right? So you can see that this is not how it works. This is, not, this is not true. And, you know, this position where they say, well, if you disobey... And you're going to be cursed in order to motivate obedience, right? Encourage obedience. It's never ever taught consistently. Why? Because the churches that teach if you disobey, you're going to be cursed, they will, they will never teach that if you obey, you're going to be physically blessed. You know, try and find a church that, that believes, that says, hey, if you are cursed, you know, if you're disobedient, you're going to be cursed and God's going to be angry at you and everything. But they will never say, you know, and that's always like 100% guaranteed with them. But they'll never 100% guarantee that if you're righteous and you are doing the right thing, that you're going to be healthy, wealthy. And it, why? Because they're going to start sounding like the Joel Osteens of the world. And they know that that's wrong, right? But then that's why I'm saying that I feel like this position that's taught amongst these churches is never consistent. Right? Because you can't take one without the other because the blessing and cursing are two sides of that one coin. Either you keep the commandments and you're blessed or you don't keep the commandments and you're cursed. So what is the correct position? Well, let's just firstly compare it like to salvation. Right? Because think about it. If you were to say salvation was by works, what's your next logical question? Well, how obedient do I need to be to earn salvation by works? Right? So when you think about the blessing and this cursing, you've got to think, well, how obedient do I need to be to be blessed? Right? So we know with salvation that it's not possible. I'll just read two verses very quickly. Galatians 2.16, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Why is that? Because Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Why is salvation not by works? Because it's not possible to keep the level of works that is required to earn salvation by works, and that's why salvation must be by grace. Now, salvation is what that Old Testament like, blessing and cursing is, that we need it by grace because we can't get it by works. So the question then remains is if people think, hey, you've got to get this blessing and get this cursing, well, how obedient do you need to be? To be blessed. Well, we don't need to guess because if we look at the verses that we turn to, well, this is in Deuteronomy 27. This is a chapter before when, it, when they talked about the curses. But this, this verse is actually quoted in Galatians 3 that we're going to go to later. But it says here um, about the curses, Cursed be he that confirmeth not all the words of this law to do them, and all the people shall, shall say, Amen. Well, so it's not talking about if you just do some of them, or you just try to do them, but you don't do them, but you still get the blessing, like, you know, or you try and do them and don't do them all, you're not free from the cursing. This is saying it's all or nothing. 
Right? This is why salvation requires perfection, because it's all or nothing. Either, either you do it all, or Jesus does it all. That's why you need Jesus to do it all, because you can't do it all. Right? And if you try and do it all, you're going to come short, and you're going to end up in hell. That's why you, you get the cursing that is talked about in this Old Testament, because you're not, you're not utilizing the covenant of grace, right? If you're putting yourself under the works of the law. So you see, it's all the words of this law. Look at what we read in Deuteronomy 28, the first verse. And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. See, that's the part of this teaching that is always missed in, you know, this prosperity gospel type preaching that, you know, in order to get God's blessing, you can't get it by works because you need to keep all the works. All right, so this is why you, it's not possible to obtain. So salvation were by works, who can be saved, right? Nobody because we can't do enough good works. We can't meet perfection. So if blessings were by works, who can be blessed, right? We would all be cursed because being blessed by the works of the law would require perfection like we saw here in these two passages. So like I talked about, you will have the wrong view of your relationship with God, if you don't understand this correctly. And it'll bring you to two conclusions, right? Like either if you believe God's love and blessings and acceptance is gained by works, it'll either make you give up because you'll never ever be good enough. You'll, you'll never feel accepted by God because if you're honest with yourself, you come short every day, right? So that will either have one effect or the other effect, the other place you'll be at is you'll just be deluded in yourself and you'll think you've earned God's you know, favor and blessing and whatnot by you know, how spiritual you are and you've just deluded yourself, right? Because we're not perfect, we're all sinners. So what is the correct position? Well, if we go to Galatians 3, Galatians 3 explains how this blessing and cursing work, right? Like where, where did they go? Like if they're in the Old Testament, What's happened to it in the New Testament? Galatians 3, verse 8. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So these are the blessings that go to Abraham, right? So then they which be of faith are blessed with faith for Abraham, for as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. So you see here the blessing, not only was the blessing associated with the law of Moses, but you had the blessings that were came from Abraham as well, right? So these are all these blessings that we receive as believers. So we see the blessing of Abraham being likened to the curse of the law of Moses, right? Saying there's this blessing and this curse for those that are under the law. Verse 11, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident that the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Right? So what is that saying? That's saying basically if you have to try and keep the law in order to be saved, then you're going to be held to the law. Right? And if you can keep them, you can live by them. But, like I said, it's not possible. Verse 13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. So you can see here how this blessing and cursing is related to salvation because this is what we're being saved from. We're being saved from this curse of the law because we were not able to obtain the blessing by works. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. Look at this. Being made a curse for us. So you see when we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that cursing is actually put on Jesus Christ and this is why by faith we can receive the blessing. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So what is the correct position? You can see how like it's, it's kind of like there's some half rights and half wrongs. There's always a bit of truth in every lie. Basically how it works is that was the old covenant. Keep the works of the law and be blessed. You don't keep them. That's the curse. That's the whole be good enough, you know, be perfect, go to heaven. 
You're not good enough. You come short of the glory of God. You go to hell. That's the blessing and the cursing. So how do we receive the blessing? We believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Where the prosperity gets it wrong, the prosperity gospel, this is not necessarily the physical, materialistic blessings in this world. Right? And how do we get, get away from the cursing? Well, it's because Jesus Christ was made a curse for us. Now, ultimately, in the new heaven and the new earth, this physical blessing and cursing right, will take effect. Obviously, the lake of fire is where the cursing is fulfilled. But, you know, one day there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth and the fields will be good and the rain will come down, you know, and all that stuff, and, that, and it will manifest physically, but not in the current world we live now. And that's why you can see this blessing that is talked about in the Old Testament. You need to understand it prophetically, right? Because if you don't, you're going to be like Asaph in Psalm 73, thinking, oh, my feet were well nigh slipped, you know, looking at the prosperity of the wicked, thinking, why is my life so hard? Why is it not like, like so for me? So that's the right position. So, in the New Testament, under the you know, covenant of grace and how, how things are changed now with the change in the priesthood and whatnot, what then is the explanation for why good things happen to people and why bad things happen to people, right? And here I'm going to give you one principle. This is the main one in, in Galatians 6. Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Right, so when we see good and bad happening to people in the New Testament. This is not necessarily a result. Well, this is not a result of blessing and cursing. This is just simply a result, generally, of just reaping what you sow. You know, why, why are people doing well in this life? It's probably because they work harder than you. You know, like, people, like, riches don't come by easy. When you see somebody successful, you see somebody, you know, doing it well financially, Generally, it's because they're just working hard. You don't see the hours and the sweat and the stress that they put in. You know, all that time that you put in, like watching videos and vegging out and going out with your friends and doing all that stuff. I mean, they're working like seven days a week. You know, that some people work so hard they don't even come to church. You know, that's, how you, that's how you know you're working too hard. <laughs> when, you're, when you're working so hard you don't come to church, you're working too hard, right? But you see... Generally, what happens is it's just reaping and sowing. sowing. People have money because they work hard. They make good financial decisions. You know, people are healthy because they exercise, they eat well. You say like, oh, you know, why sometimes, you know, why is my body like, you know, I'm overweight and doing all this. Often, more often than not, in the New Testament, it's not because you're disobedient to God, right? Sometimes it's just because you're not putting in the work. You know, your life is too sedate. You're drinking too much sugar. You're eating too much, eating too much. You know, sometimes we just eat too much. And that's why we put on to it. So it's just reaping what you sow. And also, it's, sometimes it's just the effects of sin. You know, you say like, you know, my family situation is so terrible. Relationships, it's all, sometimes, you know, fornication, adultery, you know, addiction to drugs and, you know, alcohol and all sorts of stuff. Um, even just crimes can ruin people. You know, somebody like, you know, does a, just, a, just a crime, like murders somebody. Obviously, that's going to change their life. That's going to make it harder for them to get a job in the future. They're going to reap what they sow. But that's not necessarily the blessing and cursing of God, right? That's just them, you know, getting what they deserve based on what they've sown. Now, reaping and sowing is different to... Because some people might say, oh, reaping and sowing, well, that's a bit like karma, isn't it? No, 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 because reaping and sowing is different because it's like you reap what you sow in that area that you've sown, right? It's like if you work in your business, you may sow a profit. But karma is just like if I do some good thing in this like unrelated area, some unknown impersonal force is going to like pay me back in some other area. So you see how like karma is like, it's not the reaping and sowing in the Bible. Even though like people can see oh, there's some similarities, you know, where God might do you good for something that you've done. But that's not karma. Karma is some Hindu thing that's just... It's in, the difference really is just whether you believe it's like an impersonal force or whether it's the God of the Bible. Now, so what is there then? So if, if there's no more blessing and cursing 
And, and generally, good and bad things happen to you because of um, reaping and sowing. So what mechanisms are there in the New Testament that God uses to encourage good works and discourage sin? Because if you say, if I'm blessed by God, no matter how I live, well then what, what motivation do I have to even do right? Often a lot of people will ask us this question when we explain the gospel to them. Because we say, like, you know, your salvation is by grace, no matter what you do, you're always saved. And sometimes people get the wrong, wrong idea or they misunderstand and they say, well, if I'm saved no matter what, then what's the purpose of trying to do right? Because in their mind, they think the only reason to do right is to get yourself to heaven. But all you have to understand is there are other reasons to do right. right? And you can use many examples. You, know, you can even use the analogy that the Bible uses for salvation, which is father and son. You say, well, just because your father is always your father, does that mean you should just, you know, there's no motivation to like treat them right and to respect them? And to, of course, there are other motivations. You know, you're not just trying to be a good child just so you can stay the children of your parents. You know, that's like, that would be like salvation if you're doing right to just oh, get to heaven. So you're trying to do right to stay a child. But there are other reasons why you might want to do right. You know, you want to have a good relationship with your father. You want to have, you know, you want to please your father. You want to be a good example to others for what sort of person that they should be to their parents. So there are other reasons to do right. And that's why people often will, you know, misunderstand. They think, oh, you know, they'll say, oh, people that believe salvation by grace, they'll say, oh, you don't care if people do right or not. Because in their mind, they think the only reason to do right is to get to heaven. You know, they think the only reason to do right is to get themselves to heaven, so then they think, well, what's the point of doing anything now because I'm saved anyway? And that's not the case, right? It's just different motivations now. So what, is it, what are the mechanisms now that if it's not blessing and cursing to encourage you to do right and wrong because that is doctrinally not correct and it's impossible doctrinally to keep the commandments to get the blessing and the cursing, then what is it? Well, this is where in the New Testament it is rewards and chastisement. Right? Rewards and chastisement. Right? This is different to blessing and cursing because blessing one is it's impossible to, to earn. It's impossible to get. But rewards is regardless of, you know, because you, know, you are a saved child of God, it's just based on your productivity for God. Right? It's not based on whether how obedient you are. It's based on your productivity. 1 Corinthians 3, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So you can see the way the rewards work in the New Testament, that even if you don't earn any rewards, you've been a terrible worker, you're not risking getting the cursing, right? You just, you just get your salvation. You may get nothing. All your works might be burned up if you've only done things that benefit the temporary. But if you have laid up treasures in heaven, you've worked and done things of eternal value, then you will be rewarded. That is a motivation for a Christian to build up treasure in heaven, right? To know that you've invested your life serving God so that for all eternity you will be a different stature to somebody else who has not spent their life serving God and not contributed as much to the kingdom of God. And this is where you can see in the parables of the pounds and the talents where God doles out, right, different amounts to different people and based on what they've done, he rewards them accordingly, right? So this is one motivation for us to want to serve God is are you going to spend your life investing and working for something that will eventually be gone or are you going to invest your life serving God and be rewarded eternally when he says to you well done thou good and faithful servant you know I would rather hear those words than hear you know well done thou good and faithful servant to like my necessarily my earthly boss but ideally we want both right you want to be a good worker and you want to also be a faithful servant in God's eyes now the opposite of that is not the cursing it's the chastisement chastisement look at what we see in Hebrews 12 where we see God ch chastening his children. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children, my son. 
Despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards, and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily, for a few days, chastened us after their own pleasure. But he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. So <laughs> normally I'm preaching on this passage when I'm talking about disciplining children and whatnot, but you know, the, the, the thought there, you know, the mindset we should have when we discipline our children, what is the difference between cursing and chastisement? Because, Victor, you say, hey, well, that sounds pretty harsh. What's the difference between the curse of God and him coming down hard on your life and him chastising you and making your life difficult? You know what the difference is? The difference is love. Right? One is done out of love and one is done out of anger and hatred. And this is why if you understand blessing and cursing and chastisement and rewards correctly, it's going to change how you view your relationship with God when you're in trouble, you know what I mean? And, and this is the difference between like good discipline in the home and bad discipline in the home. Like sometimes kids, they, all they experience is the anger and wrath and hatred and their parents despise them and don't want anything to do with them. That's like the cursing of God, like you're forsaken and you get in trouble and you're cursed and you, you feel unloved, you, you don't, you know, your parents are not there. But that's the difference between chastisement and cursing. Because the person that believes they're cursed of God for their disobedience is the one that feels left alone. The one that feels that God has forsaken them. The one that feels that God is done with them. But if you understand chastisement is different, it's, it's the very opposite. It's the fact that God loves you. It's the fact that God has not forsaken you. It's the fact that God still cares enough about you to mold you and to correct you to make you more like the image of Jesus Christ. And even though that might seem like, you know, splitting hairs, or just, it'll make a huge difference in your spiritual life when you understand this. Because, like I said, you're not going to get discouraged from doing right you always know you have a second chance with God, a third chance, that you can try again because a loving God is there wanting you to come back, right? Rather than a God that is angry with you, that you're just like trying to earn, you know, his grace back into his favor, right? So this is the sort of God we serve. We serve a God that loves us, right? That chastens us. He doesn't curse us, okay? So just to recap, you know, under... You know, the law, there's blessings and cursings. And under grace, you know, you have reaping and sowing, which people may mistake for blessing and cursing, but we have rewards and chastisement. And like I said, it's important to have uh, a right understanding of this doctrine because the wrong understanding, it can really make you ineffective as a Christian. Because you know what? None of us are perfect all of us have ups and downs in our Christian life. But sometimes you get an opportunity to share the gospel with somebody when you haven't been all that great yourself. But you know, when you understand grace and you understand that God loves you, you can still have the confidence to share the gospel with that person. And in fact, sharing the gospel with that person will remind you of how much God loves you, even when you're not living right. But you imagine trying to share the gospel when you don't even know you're saved and you don't even know if God loves you. How are you going to tell somebody else that God loves them? You know, so it has a huge impact on your Christian life and on your Christian work. So I hope this sermon helps you understand that better. And, you know, we ought to be motivated to serve God by the love of God. You know, even though sometimes we need a bit of a spank on the bottom to get us moving. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for your love. We are not perfect and we come short every day. But uh, I pray, Lord, that the love we experience from you would compel us to want to serve you and tell others about you. So we pray 
and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.